Let me just start off by saying that Gary is uh, a perfect example of how amazing the Type 1 diabetes community is. He is such a stellar, amazing individual. I, I, um, when we talked about having a technology update, I immediately thought of Gary because I had heard him on a on a pod podcast I like a lot um, called Diabetes Connections. Um, it's it's a very popular uh, podcast um, run out of North Carolina um, from a, um, a broadcasting mom who has type one diabetes. And so Gary was a guest on the show, and it was just fascinating to listen to him talk. Um, he is whip smart and um, and also very down to earth and personable. Gary um, has had diabetes since 1985. Um, he is a um, certified um, diabetes educator who trained at the, the Harvard Jocelyn Diabetes Center. He also has a, a bachelor's in psychology and a master's level um, exercise and physio exercise physiology degree. Um, in 2014, he was um, awarded the um, uh, CDE of the year, the Certified Diabetes Educator of the Year. Um, he's an active volunteer for the American Diabetes Association and for JDRF. Um, he helps volunteer for two diabetes camps, and he's on the advisory board for several um, diabetes device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies. He's authored multiple books, many articles, uh, and is a local, national, and international speaker. Um, his books include You Can Control Diabetes, Think Like a Pancreas, The Ultimate Guide to Accurate Carb Counting, Getting Control of Your Blood Sugars Until There's a Cure, Practical CGM, and Diabetes, um, How to Help. So um, Gary has personal experience, apparently, with every uh, available pump and CGM that's on the market. Um, uh, he has deep expertise in this area, both professionally and personally. Um, and uh, he lives in Philadelphia with his wife and uh, four kids, and apparently had a cat and a hamster as well. Yeah, so welcome, Gary. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Mustache. I got to remember that one. <laughs> uh, if, if I'm so smart, why do my blood I don't even see these, but why do my blood sugars look like this today? I mean, they're bouncing around a fair amount. Um, there you go, you can see it now. Yeah. Pretty impressive, huh? Up and down, up and down. This is life with diabetes as we all know it. Um, I wanna know a little bit about the group. Now, you're, you're based around the Portland area? Yeah, the greater, yeah. We have, we draw from um, uh, Southwest Washington, all over Oregon, uh, but a lot in, in Portland, yeah. Okay, all right. Well, I am I'm a big hoops guy, and if you could send Damian Lillard our way, I <laughs> could make very good use of that guy. He's amazing. Yeah, he's having quite a season too. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I, one thing I've learned over the years, I've been in clinical practice for over 25 years now, that as the technology improves, the diabetes management doesn't always follow and the quality of life doesn't always follow. It really takes a partnership between the user and the technology to, to really make things work well. Uh, so does everybody here have a child with diabetes or does anyone here have type one themselves? I like that we're getting the C's for, for child there. All right, so. Have myself. Yeah, I'm I can only see 12 of you at a time on this. I'm trying to see how I can get everybody else on screen. Well, yell out. I mean, if anybody has type 1 themselves, just to say I'm a type 1. I have type 1. Okay. Yeah, but you're like, what, eight years old? <laughs> I have type 1. Okay, so a few you do. But a lot of a lot of your parents or kids with type one, it looks like. Oh. Have type one and a parent. All right. Okay. How many of you uh, use an insulin pump? Y'all have pump if you use a pump. Use like a pump. Do. How many use a continuous um, glucose monitor? Use a monitor. 
All right. How many are using a kind of a hybrid closed loop that integrates the two? Some do, some don't. Because that, that's a topic I wanted to focus in on tonight, because I think there's a lot to learn from you know, this whole thing. Now, if I click on present now, let's see if I can get this to work. Allow, select window or screen, entire screen. Allow. OK, are you seeing um, a slide that says hybrid closed loop systems? Someone yes. say because I can't see you anymore. Yes, we are. Okay, that's good. Uh, so that that's what I want to discuss: our hybrid closed loop systems. Uh, we call them hybrid closed loop systems because they don't completely automate everything. They, they automate some aspects of diabetes management, but not all of them. Uh, you already got all of my background. I've had type one for thirty-five years now. And, um, so let's think about the responsibilities of the person with type 1 diabetes and or their caregiver. Uh, there's a lot we're responsible for. We, we need to match our basal insulin doses to what our needs are. And basal insulin really is the foundation of our insulin program. Trying to build your program without the correct basal settings is, is like building a house on a very crooked foundation. It's going to be a real struggle. And basal insulin is really supposed to keep glucose levels stable you know, between meals and while we're sleeping. And its its purpose is really to offset the glucose that our liver secretes throughout the day and night. And, and it does vary by time of day. So both basal and mealtime insulin doses need to be configured properly. The timing of the insulins has to be correct also. The basal in particular just about everybody has somewhat of a peak and valley to their daily insulin requirement. And getting that set up correctly is pretty important. Uh, likewise, bolus insulin has to be timed properly. If we take our bolus insulin too early, we're going to drop low after the meal. If we take it too late, we're going to spike up too high after the meal. So the timing has to be correct. We have to make adjustments for physical activity, not just during, but sometimes for hours after the activity is, is concluded. And then there's all the other factors that come into play in daily life, stresses and illnesses, infections, any kind of hormone fluctuations. And with kids, we got a little thing called growth to deal with as well that contributes to changes in insulin needs. So clearly there's a lot that we have to do uh, to balance our insulin against our body's needs. So how are we doing, you know, managing this on our own? I love this Homer Simpson vision of uh, making, he had to make breakfast on his own one day and you'd see what happened. But managing diabetes on our own, you know, without any kind of automated approach. Overall, people with type 1 diabetes average an a A1C of about eight and a half. And when you consider how often people are meeting the ADA goals of A1Cs below seven for adults, seven and a half for kids. It's only happening about 20% of the time overall. It means 80% of people have A1Cs that are higher than they should be. Hypoglycemia and severe hypoglycemia continues to be a problem. Even with CGM, even with pumps, it continues to be a problem. Ketoacidosis continues to be a problem as well. And then when we look at this, this newer metric, time in range, and, and I feel time in range is a more valid metric than an A1C because it's really a quality measure, not a quantity measure. You know, when we work with patients, we always come up with an individualized time in range, but most research studies look at 70 to 180 as kind of an acceptable range. And People with type 1 diabetes are only in their target, that target range about half the time. It means they spend about 12 hours a day in a glucose range that's either dangerous or hindering their performance, uh, their ability to function. Uh, so clearly, we're, we're not doing a very good job uh, with the tools that, that, are, that we have access to now. And, and this is why automated insulin delivery uh, ha has been developed. Uh, automated insulin delivery simply means a system that makes some decisions on the user's behalf and adjusts insulin automatically. These systems all involve three components. There's an insulin pump that delivers the insulin. 
is a continuous glucose sensor that's measuring blood sugar and transmitting a signal to a computer program. And that computer program interprets the glucose data and then signals the pump whether to increase or decrease the insulin delivery or whether to leave it alone for the time being. It's very much like cruise control on a car. If you're speeding up, it, it breaks for you. If you're slowing down, it, it hits the gas. Or it's like a, a thermostat on your house. If it heats up, you know, the air conditioner kicks on. If it gets cold, the heat kicks on. It's trying to achieve a, a certain you know, in, intermediate point all the time. But what exactly is automated in these systems? Now, the very first uh, hybrid closed loop system was introduced by Medtronic you know, several years ago. And all that system did was turn basal insulin off if a person's glucose was low. Now, that didn't help a whole lot because it's kind of too little too late to shut the basal off if you're already low. That's going to have an effect <laughs> a few hours later. It's not going to help you right then and there. Uh, but that was the first thing that they could get approved by the FDA. The next step was a, a mechanism for preventing low blood sugar. Uh, they're kind of a hypo-prevent feature, where if your glucose was, was trending down and headed low, it would shut the basal off to hopefully either prevent it or minimize the severity of that low. Where we're at currently with most of these hybrid closed loop systems is we have the hypo prevent, but we also have a hyper or a high prevent feature where if glucose is trending up, the system will automatically start to bump up the basal delivery. They'll also fix high readings by either increasing the basal or in some cases now with a few of the systems, they'll administer correction boluses automatically to fix the high. So we're now at a point where basal insulin can be nudged up or down based on where the glucose is and where it's headed. And with some systems, it can fix highs a little bit quicker by administering a small correction bolus to get the reading back down. The next steps, the future steps, are systems that can automatically bolus to cover our meals and make adjustments to handle things like stress and illness and exercise, things that might cause rapid or significant changes in the blood sugar fairly quickly. We're not at the point yet where uh, these systems can do that. You know, that's why we call it a hybrid closed loop. Part of the loop is closed, but not all of it. So thinking about basal adjustment, you, know, you might think, eh, what good does that do? It, it really does a nice job if you have a long stretch of time where you're not doing things like eating or bolusing or exercising that causes a rapid change in the blood sugar. Think about it like a, a cruise ship and the captain wants to go to sleep, so he puts on cruise control at night. If the ship starts to veer off course a little bit, cruise control will, sh will turn the wheel and get it on right into port by morning. If it starts to go the other direction at night, it'll, go the, it'll raise it a little bit by morning. Most people who use hybrid closed loop systems find these, th these things work great overnight. It's rare to wake up with a glucose level that's not right near your target range. During the daytime, not always as much, but certainly at night when there's not much else going on and these basal adjustments have enough time to affect the glucose and get you on track. What we can achieve with a system like that, and again, this varies not just from system to system, but person to person. Overall, we tend to see average glucoses in the low to mid hundreds when people utilize a hybrid closed loop properly. Time in range is generally in the 70 to 80 percent range. We tend to see less hypoglycemia and certainly less significant lows, less chances for severe lows. There's less variability overall. I think of the, uh, the automated adjustments kind of like a butler that follows you around cleaning up your little messes. We all under and overdose for things sometimes. And these automated basal adjustments can help compensate for those. So we don't end up with extreme highs or lows as a result. For the user, but even more so for their, their caregivers and their loved ones, there's a lot less stress and anxiety around blood sugar control.
especially at night. There's a lot less nervous energy being spent checking glucoses in the middle of the night and worrying, et cetera, because these systems do a really nice job of keeping things in a healthy range. And for the user and some of their caregivers, there's less micromanagement, a lot less brain power that has to go into the day-to-day -day management. However, there still is brain power required, as you'll see in a moment. These basal adjustments cannot do everything. You know, think about that movie Titanic. The Titanic was an enormous ship that was moving at a really high speed. They were trying to get back to the port of New York before everyone thought they would and set a record for cross-Atlantic journeys. So you got a big, fast-moving ship with a very small rudder. They saw the iceberg, they turned the wheel, but they couldn't turn fast enough. And that's what happens when all you're doing is nudging basal rates up and down or administering tiny micro boluses to try to fix highs. It takes a while for those kind of adjustments to affect the glucose level. If you got an iceberg dead ahead, it's not gonna help you to avoid it. So what represent icebergs when it comes to diabetes management? Food represents an iceberg. It's something that raises the blood sugar fairly quickly. So we don't have the capability yet to automatically adjust insulin to cover food. By the time these systems realize that the blood sugar is rising from food you just recently ate, it's too late. Your glucose is going to spike up extremely high before it can administer insulin that begins to work. Exercise is an iceberg. When the glucose drops, fairly quickly during a workout or any kind of physical activity. All you can do is, is pair back on the basal insulin delivery, but all the basal you got for the last three or four hours is still working. So the glucose can continue to decline quite a bit. Stress that can cause a rapid rise in the blood sugar is also not controllable with a system like this nor is bolus insulin. Bolus insulin is going to drop the glucose quickly. You can't offset that with subtle basal adjustments. Certain medications, you know, particularly steroid medications like cortisone and prednisone, can't be offset with these systems. Insulin delivery is also an iceberg. And when I refer to insulin delivery, I, I really mean insulin delivery problems. Those of us who use pumps know they're far from foolproof. Infusion site issues can really limit what we can accomplish. Just because we administered a bolus for delivered basal insulin doesn't mean it actually got into our bodies and absorbed and acted as we expected it to. So the, you know, the inconsistency that that creates is also a limitation or a limiting factor with a hybrid closed loop. So this is why you know, the user still remains mostly in charge. These hybrid closed loops can help with a little bit of, of the decision making, but the user still has to do the majority of the management. To get to the next step, to go from a hybrid closed loop to a fully closed loop, or what the JDRF likes to call an artificial pancreas, we're going to need a lot of stuff. First, we need continuous glucose monitors that aren't just more accurate, but also continuous. We can't have a, a system with you know, warm-up periods that last for hours and signal transmission that doesn't get through for extended periods of time, because now all of a sudden you lose your, your closed loop features. We need better infusion devices so that we can count on the insulin that was delivered to be working when we expect it to. We're going to need much faster acting insulin. And right now we do have insulins like Fiosp and Lumjev, but they only work slightly faster than what's on the market with Humalog and Novolog. You know, you get maybe a five to 10 minute earlier peak time with those insulins. And for most people, that's just not nearly enough uh, to be able to bolus after you've eaten. You still have to give insulin ahead of time. There's also a couple of other hormones that may be necessary to truly develop a, an effective closed loop. Amylin is a hormone that's normally secreted along with insulin by the beta cells. And that hormone amylin is responsible for controlling the rate of digestion. It slows down digestion considerably so that the blood sugar doesn't spike all at once. It makes it much easier to control between meal glucose we may need a combination of amylin and insulin uh, to make a closed loop work properly. 
And currently we don't have a way to raise the blood sugar very quickly. All we can do is stop delivering insulin, which will help the blood sugar rise, but it's gonna take time. You're not gonna see much effect from that for at least 30 to 60 minutes. If you need a more rapid rise, we're gonna need glucagon in the equation. I mean, there are a couple of projects underway looking at you know, administering glucagon when glucose is falling and insulin when it's rising, but you know, there's still a lot of work that has to be done in that area. So the systems that we have right now, uh, Medtronic recently launched its 770G, which works just with their own Medtronic sensor. And it, it's a small improvement over the 670. I mean, it basically is the 670 with a few of the, we'll call them nuisance alerts that have been eliminated. And they set it up to use Bluetooth so that it's it can communicate with smartphones. And there's a smartphone app that goes with it. Uh, Tandem launched the X2 pump over a year ago uh, with their control IQ feature. It's been a very popular system. It functions with the Dexcom G6. Uh, it's fairly turnkey. I mean, you, you can take it out of the box, start programming and using it almost right away. Um, and it, it is a pretty effective system. Well, uh, I would just say that if you're using a hybrid closed loop, it's very important to get your basal and bolus settings established correctly before you start using them. And if you're already on one, that can still be done, but you have to turn off the automated mode to test your basal rates and see if things are really working right. Um, it's important to trust the system. You know, the whole overriding what it recommends is not a good idea. It's really thinking things through. It's considering uh, basal adjustments. It's considering previous boluses when it's making its recommendations for doses. Um, so some of the other things I usually recommend, uh, if you have to treat a low, you're going to need less carb than usual because these systems are already pairing back on basal insulin on your behalf. Uh, enter all the carbs you eat. Uh, even if you're treating a low, put those carbs in too. And uh, timing becomes a very important issue when you're using a hybrid closed loop. If you bolus late, you're going to experience two problems. You're going to spike up, and then you're probably going to wind up low a few hours later. Because if, if your glucose is spiking and you haven't bolus for a meal recently, the algorithm is going to assume that you need a lot more basal insulin to fix that. So it's going to deliver extra insulin. And then if you enter your carbs and bolus on top of that, it's like double covering your meal, and you're going to wind up low. So it's always necessary to pre-bolus before eating. Um, most of them allow you to extend boluses, but Medtronic does not. Um, so with the other ones, you can still extend your bolus if it's a, a slow digesting meal. Medtronic, you, you kind of have to get creative and bolus for half your meal up front and half of it later. Uh, and I recommend working with experts who understand these things. We'd like to think that these closed loop systems uh, should you know, make everything simpler and easier, and they do once you know how to manage them properly. But getting to that point, it really does help to work with people who understand how they function. And I'm proud that you know I've got a clinical staff of six people that uh, all have type one diabetes. We all wear every one of these systems to try them out, so we've got some personal and professional uh, experience with, it, with everything that's out there now. Okay, exercise is something also, I don't feel that the overrides that these systems have in place are sufficient for managing sugars with exercise. You, know, you can temporarily raise the target a little bit, but you know, if you're working out, it's not gonna really help that much to prevent a low. You have to set it at least an hour ahead of time. Um, and you know, most people aren't thinking that far ahead. So the old fashioned approaches of either eating rapid acting carbs before the workout or cutting the boluses you take before the workout are, are usually better approaches. So I'm Gary, sure I'm had their own experiences and might want to share. If there's questions, I'm happy to take them. Well, I was I was curious, Gary. This is Dr. Mustache. <laughs> um, so um, with the with the with the tandem. Um, control IQ system. Were you were you recommending going into exercise mode an hour before exercise? 
at least an hour. And even with that, you know, if it's a modest workout, like if, you know, a walk where you're not working extensively hard, it might be enough. But for most hardcore workouts, it's not going to be sufficient. Simply cutting back on basal insulin is not going to be enough to prevent a steep decline in the blood sugar. So that feature, it'll work a little bit, especially with long-term activities, it can be helpful. But for shorter bouts of exercise, it's not going to make enough of a difference. So do you recommend, you know, maybe a, at least at least an hour, maybe more of, of turning off or going into the exercise mode, mm -hmm. but then also um, sort of having a carb, a little bit of a carb load right before you might need to, and you know that diabetes is all about trial and adjustment. You, know, you just try it and see how it works, and then you go back to and, and adjust as needed. With Medtronic, the temp target would need to be set well in advance. And with Loop, you need to switch to a, temp, uh, a, temporary, pro, a temporary override ahead of time. But you got to think well in advance if you want to use system approaches. I still, I find it's better just use the old fashioned methods of if you work out after a meal, cut your bolus significantly. If you work out before or between meals, use rapid acting carbs to keep your glucose stable. Um. We had some questions about um, about Omnipod and what's on the horizon with Omnipod. Yeah, yeah the Omnipod 5 uh, was submitted to the FDA in December and is supposed to hear back within six months. So the chances are they'll hear back you know, in the next month or two. That doesn't mean it's going to be approved as is. They, they may have to make some adjustments or whatever, uh, but it'll likely get approved sometime middle of this year. And they're planning a limited rollout. Clinics that do a fair amount of Omnipod work are going to get it, access to it first. So they're not going to make it available to everybody who st wants to start on an Omnipod right away. Now, their system has the algorithm built right into the pods. So the app that goes on an Android phone is only going to be necessary for starting up a new pod and uh, transmitting the basal settings in. Um, the boluses would also get done through the app, but the, the algorithms in the pod, so even if you don't have that phone app with you, the basal will deliver and the adjustments to the basal will deliver because the Dexcom data will, will be received. By it. Um, they're doing one pretty unique thing with that uh, Omnipod 5. Boluses are going to be adjusted based on the vector of a CGM. So if the glucose is rising a lot when you're bolusing, they're going to add a certain amount to the bolus. And if it's declining quickly, they're going to delete from the bolus. So I think that's a smart approach. We've been teaching patients to do that for years, and they just have to think about and remember to do it manually. So the Omnipod is going to have an automatic adjustment built in for that. Got it. They are planning an iPhone version somewhere in the near future, but initially it's going to be only work on an Android. So if you have an Android phone, you'll be able to install it on there. If not, they'll give you a device kind of like their Dash programmer now, where they just you know, rip out all the guts of it. And the only thing that functions is, is their app. Got it. You know, Gary, I, um, it's not uncommon for me to work with, um, with a kid who would really probably benefit, um, uh, certainly from a CGM, but, but even more from a, from a hybrid closely system. Um, but it's not uncommon in these scenarios for a kid really to be fairly resistant to, um, to technology. I sometimes think about it a little bit sort of like, um, ex excuse the, comparison but uh, you know, since i'm a general pediatrician when i see parents um, trying to potty train a kid and they're all over the kid and really trying to get the kid to do it it's the last thing the kid wants to do um but i'm just curious how you would work through one of these scenarios where there's a kid who seems kind of really 
he, you know, hesitant about wanting to explore technology? You know, I think it depends on the age of the kid. You know, kids mature at different rates. But, you know, if you got a kid who's, you know, just skeptical, doesn't like having a device on them, that's normal. No one likes having a device on them. The thing is, if it's a child who can make competent decisions about their health and medical care, that's different from a child who's not at an age where they're able to do that. Uh, and I think sometimes a, you know, the parent just has to stand up and say, no, we're going to do this and you'll get used to it. Uh, because we know that when kids give these things to try, it grows on them. Really like them. Um, and the fact that, you know, the CGM, you eliminate so many finger sticks, the pump, you're eliminating injections, and, and the co combination, we're able to regulate the glucose so much better when, when everything's linked together. So if, if you, you got a young child, sometimes you just have to stand up and say, no, we're going to do this. And <laughs> you don't have a choice. We're going to do it. We can make it, we can make the pump pretty for you. We can use colorful stickers and this and that, but it's going to happen. You know, it's just situations where you have to do that. And I think with kids of, who are a little older, once they start meeting other kids their age that are using these systems, they're sold like that. <laughs> it's a pretty easy uh, transition. So getting them to dive these, these camps and you know, JDRF meetings and so on is so helpful. Someone named Deborah had posted a couple of questions. One was about uh, when is the ILET going to be available? Now, that's a system that Dr. Ed Damiano in Massachusetts has been working on. And originally, he planned to launch it as a dual hormone system that administered insulin when glucose rises and glucagon when it's dropping. They were, they had to put that on hold because they didn't have stable liquid glucagon. But now they do. Um, there's a couple of companies that have released new glucagon formulations that are stable in liquid form at room temp. So they're moving ahead with their research again. But initially they're planning to launch their system as insulin only. Uh, they still, I think they're only in you know, beginning phase two trials. It's going to be a while yet before that's available. There was also a question about the in-pen from Companion Medical. Uh, there's some erroneous information there. The, Companion Medical was recently acquired by Medtronic. So it's now the in-pen from Medtronic. Um, I love that device. Uh, for people who want to be on multiple injection therapy, it is nothing better. Uh, the in-pen, the pen itself has Bluetooth capability. Otherwise, it's a standard half-unit pen. But the app that it communicates with has some nice intelligence to it. It does dosage calculations based on glucose and carb entry and insulin on board. It logs everything. So when you dose with the pen, it transmits into the app so you know how much was taken and when which is great for a user because you, you can't remember if you took your shot, it's right there. And it's even better for healthcare providers because we've got log sheets now, everything's all laid out. We don't know if somebody missed a shot or took a shot, it's, it's all right there. So I, I think the InPen's a wonderful device. I have a question. This kind of goes to your comment on our my, our three kids have type one and they're all on the um, tandem hybrid um, mm -hmm. system. And I think it goes to your question about, um, you know, you have to make sure, take the time to make sure you have your basal and your bolus right before you are go into the control IQ. Um, and so my question is kind of really, I, I'm, I'm guessing maybe the answer is going to be like, well, if you know you have the your basal and bolus right you'll be fine with it but i wonder if you run into or if you have any advice for um i've been surprised because our kids when they're on the medtronic it was so fussy they rarely wanted to wear their sensors and now where they're all on their you know all sensors all the time because it really has made a huge difference for them but as a consequence we've become one of those families which i used to observe um that is really reliant on, it's like we, it's it's as if we don't, you know, what, oh my God, the sensor failed. It's like, then we have to go back, you know, it, 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 as if we can't, we've only been doing this for 13 years across three of them. But that said, 
I feel even, you know, with the experience under my belt, if one of them fails at night, I get nervous. Like, oh, I'm not, I'm super confident in the system, but am I confident in the system without it being able to talk to the CGM? So I wonder if you have any like input on that, or is it just a matter of making sure you trust your, the basil and bolus that you have programmed and then don't worry about it. But I do feel, I don't feel, I feel so much less anxious with that in place now, except in those kinds of circumstances. Three kids with type one, you must have test strips hidden in couch cushions and everywhere. Yeah, gotta... less now, less now, yeah. yeah. Where's the strangest place you ever found an old used test strip? God, I don't know, like her hair. You, you, I don't know. I have to think about that. Yeah. Her hair. <laughs> All right. I've heard some interesting stories about where people have found those. Uh, yeah, the thing about any of these systems is, is if they're not, if you don't, not getting glucose data from the sensor, it'll revert back to your standard settings. Well, it's going to happen sometimes. You know, if the sensor signal's not clear, if the it comes out of the skin, whatever. Uh, so that that's another reason why it's important to have your standard settings pretty close to what they need to be. You know, if, if they're off by a lot, and you're reverting back to that, then your control is really going to suffer. Uh, but you know, any any CGM system, occasionally you're going to have interruptions. You're also going to have times where the sensor just doesn't perform well. Uh, I, I still recommend. I assume. Most people here are using Dexcom since you have type one, but uh, even with Dexcom, I always recommend doing a finger stick on day one of a sensor just to make sure it's working all right. Because if it's not performing well on day one, it's going to perform poorly for the next 10 days. It's not going to get better on its own. So if there's a good size discrepancy, like more than 20% between the two, enter it as a calibration so that it can get on track. You know, and then you know, a few hours later, check again to make sure it's still working right. Uh, anytime there, there's a, a signal interruption, it's a good idea to finger stick. Uh, if there's gaps in the data, you finger stick. During warm-up times, you need to finger stick. So it's reasonable to do at least a, a handful of finger sticks each week, even when you're using a Dexcom or a Libre that doesn't require a calibration. Medtronic, obviously, it doesn't work if you don't calibrate it at least twice a day. Three or four times a day, it does perform better. Um, but even with the other ones, I'd still do it. And, and use a, a good meter. You know, a lot of people are using these old meters that didn't perform well when they came out and still don't perform well. You know, the, the best meters out there, I would say the, the, the Contour Next is top of the list in terms of accuracy. The newer AccuCheck, like the AccuCheck Guide, is also very good. Uh, the Freestyle Light is pretty good. Um, and those are the, probably the better ones on the market today. Our, our diabetes educator, who um, is our basically works at camp and has worked there for years, she insists that we don't ever use meters over uh, over again. So we use them one year and then we dispose of them. Uh, is that something that people should be doing is, is replacing their meter regularly? Does it, I mean, other than the technology advancement in meters, right. do they actually yeah. wear out or, you know? No. Yeah. The, the technology is not in the meter itself, it's in the strips. The strips oh. is where all the electronics are, it's where all the chemistry is. It's all in the strips. The meter is just a, it's like a reader that runs an electric pulse through the strip. So there's nothing about the meter that you have to worry about. Just make sure your strips have been stored properly. They haven't expired, things like that. But you know, there's no reason to replace a meter with the same one a year later. It's not that it I can might, It might be because we do, you know, 50,000 sticks a summer or something like that. And they get, they get kind of gross. Maybe that's the reason. <laughs> Grossness is a good reason to get something. Yeah. Not not gross. I mean, parents just you know they they are they are hygienic. They are cleaned very well every time we use them. I just mean like, I don't really know. Maybe it's the bags or the or the case that gets gross. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, my meter case used to have so many little red spots all over it. I'd never carry a tissue with me, so I would just use my meter case to blot my finger. 
and forget about the Landsats. Years ago, someone asked me at a conference, when was the last time I changed my Landsat? And I had to think about it. What year is this? I couldn't even remember. We have a Bless guy who you comes for to, that. <laughs> we have a guy who comes to adult camp. He says he still has his first meter. He's had diabetes for like 30 years or something. He has his first uh, finger sticker, which is like the guillotine kind. Oh, the, the auto let. Yeah, yeah, he's like, I, hey, it works. I, I mean, you know, I still he, use it. He me a diabetes museum in our office, and I've got that prominently. My, my original <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. We're just under a year into it, and we're still doing injections, and that kind of feels right for right now. But um, I, I was actually curious if, if there's a pump that just does basal, um, because I liked that aspect of what he was saying, but for now we feel more comfortable with just do the, especially with his doses being so small. Um, but is there like a basal only pump? You can set the pump for basal only because you have to program it to do the boluses. So if you never push the bolus button, it would just do basal, but. And a lot of times, Annie, when people, when they've been on the pump for a long time, or if they're like, um, well, this is a little different. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking actually the reverse when people use the, when they take a pump break and they inject basal, but use it for bolus. But yeah, you can just set it for basals. Okay. I'm yeah, curious, does anybody down. use any long acting insulin along with your pump so that you can disconnect for longer times? I think Dr. Eidelman called it the untethered method where you, so you never have a time where <laughs> pump fails. You have no basal insulin. You've always got that little 10% or 15% of um, injected basal. Anybody ever hear we about that? We consider doing it last summer because our, when our kids are, they, they especially there's this month period where they're at a lake and they're swimming a lot. So their pumps are off for like hours at a time. And we would find there was a lot of volatility because of that. So we were going to untether for the month, but it we didn't for whatever reason, but they have several friends that have done that for that purpose. I just didn't know if that would really mess with the um, programs that are the hybrid ones or if it would actually work better. Because I, I talked to a mom that's doing that with her, her kiddo and, and she's really impressed with it, but I didn't know if anybody else was trying that or not. I've never been able to convince my daughter to try it. I did enough experimenting with her as it was. I was always bringing home gadgets and gadgets for her to try. <laughs> Feels like it would be hard. I don't know enough about it, so I shouldn't really be speaking. But it does feel like it'd be a little hard with the, the hybrid closed loop because it's like, how is it accounting for if you're taking long term? How is it factoring that in when it's you know normally just giving you these little incremental fast acting for your basal? So I wonder how that works. That seems like it would be challenging, but maybe not. Yeah, I don't know if you, I don't know if you'd use that strategy with a with a yeah. hybrid closed loop. Um, just take it out of that. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Exactly. Then, but that'd be another good person to have if he would talk would be Steve Edelman. He is funny. He has type one diabetes and he's the one that first started doing that before all the hybrid pumps and stuff. So he's a big avid um, surfer. That's why he started doing it because he would disconnect for long periods of time surfing and would have to keep coming back into, you know, hook up to his pump and give himself a bolus and unhook and then go back surfing. So anyway, just curious. Yeah, that seems like the one limitation for the the pump is when like our daughter was in swim uh, on a swim team and there would be hours at a time where she couldn't wear the pump. And that's really what gives the basil the whole time. Uh, so that we that was the only time we thought, well, maybe we should be doing um, the long acting basil but then, yeah, it gets a little complicated pretty quickly. Is everybody, is anyone here, I know Annie is is kind of in the market for pumps uh, or a pump for her son, um, but is everybody using pumps? Obviously this is Tech Night, so you probably came because you are interested in the technology um, it, that that you like or that you're really, that are you're kind of, we've tried the old Medtronic Mini Med and now we're on the X2 or our daughter, our daughter's 13. She's on the um, the X2, which is the tandem one. Uh, and and so I'm just curious, you know, if, just to give people out there uh, an idea of which ones. I know that Omnipod is now they're they're they have a loyal following, uh, and they're just now getting into kind of the hybrid closed loop thing now too, right? 
I think they're having trouble getting that through the FDA or the approval. And I don't know if it's because of the COVID thing or what it is, but um, and that's been a real drag because people love the Omnipod, but they've been waiting for over a year for it to do the closed loop thing and they still haven't got approval. We've been waiting so long for Omnipod. I've had an Omnipod since I was in the seventh grade. So, oh, I don't know however like many years, years. it was, like 10 years or so. <laughs> yeah, two years, because I'm only eight year old, yeah. Um, um, yeah, I have literally, I went from shots or the insulin pen to the Omnipod. So I've never not had the Omnipod before actually, because I tried, I tested a pump with tubing and I absolutely hated it because it was like a very active child and played competitive sports. And for those reasons of taking off the pump for so long, that's why I always went with the Omnipod. Um, but I will say they have been promising and promising improvements for many, many years. And I've been in the long haul with them and there's not been as much as I would hoped. So despite that, I still love the Omnipod and I have a very hard time. This The closed loop system is the first time anything has come up that has made me consider switching off of the Omnipod. For me, that might be something that um, outweighs not having a pump with tubing, but I don't know. We'll see. We Our kids have used um, Animus when that was still a pump and Medtronic um, 670G, and they're all on the tandem um, control IQ. Um, they all have also had pumps. I think it really depends on the kid because they were super active kids and had pumps starting from our youngest age four and he always had a tube pump and never had a problem with it with all of his activities so it maybe depends on the activities you're doing or just your how you adjust to it but we didn't have any problems and we we were on the 670 and um switched everybody over happily so that was our experience <laughs> yeah rob hey george yeah um i had my doctor uh use long acting with the pump uh, on a cruise uh, where you're in the pool or <laughs> out and about and stuff like that, snorkeling, that sort of thing. And what he did is he uh, used uh, long acting for the basal and then cut the basal on the pump way, way down. But the thing is that was for a whole week. It wouldn't be, you know, based on per day. Because yeah. the long acting takes 18 hours for it to wear off. Right.